believe it or not, there are 106 suburbs across Australia that are cheaper today than they were five years ago, despite house and unit prices doubling in the same time. And, hey, they're not in the outback and regional Australia. I think you're going to be surprised where they are. That's one of the things I'm going to be discussing today with Dr Nicola Powell, Domain's Chief of Research and Economics. We're also going to discuss Domain's latest reports covering our housing and our rental markets. As somebody interested in property, you're probably pleased that now we've had 16 months of continuous property price and rental growth. But can this continue? Is it sustainable? Well, we're going to talk about what's ahead in our property markets with Nicola today. So whether you're a prospective home buyer looking for some insights, a seasoned investor, or you're just curious about what's happening in real estate, I'm sure you're going to get some insights from my chat. So let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Hi, Nicola. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on again. Well, we get together every three months or so to discuss the latest domain house price reports, but more importantly also domains research to find out what's happening in our housing markets and what you see is ahead. And since we last spoke, a number of new highs have been reached, both in house prices and rents, Nicola. Absolutely. I think our housing market, it continues to defy expectation almost. It just continues to, to increase. We've still got very challenging conditions across the rental sector and we've got many capital cities achieving new record highs, which you know, I think is is quite remarkable, really, given the current economic circumstances that are impacting Australia. But, you know, you and I talk about this frequently, and it really just underpins the undersupply of housing that we have across Australia. And, you know, that continues to drive growth. Well, in the recent budget, the government's, it's an election year, isn't it, uh, Nicola, has <laughs> yes. come up with a number of ideas. They've actually recognised that there's a housing issue. Despite some good rhetoric, I can't see anything changing in the short term. And the main reason is we need new supply. Everyone knows that. But the cost of new supply just is so much more than the current market is prepared to pay that developers aren't going to take the financial risk, banks aren't going to support it. Currently, home buyers and investors are not going to pay what it takes to bring on new developments. All that means is property prices are going to have to keep going up. It's just that stage of the cycle until the market moves on again. Yeah, absolutely right there, Michael. And, and, you know, I think it is interesting when you do look at the budget and all of those housing uh, initiatives in there are really designed to help them achieve their target of that 1.2 million homes over the next five years, which we really know is a stretchy goal. Yes. And, you know, we've already had the New South Wales Premier say that they're unlikely to meet their housing target. So it is challenging for all of the reasons that you did mention. And supply, as you say, takes such a long period of time to actually get to get to market. I think, you know, when you look at the budget, I was, I was quite pleased to see some of those uh, initiatives, particularly kind of in the build to rent sector as well, the attempt to attract foreign investment into the build to rent sector. You know, the feasibility of projects is a big thing here. And, you know, developers are only going to build if they are feasible. And often it's getting those pre-sales at the moment that is really challenging. And I think, as you rightly said, what we've got at the moment is people are going to the established market because it's technically cheaper to buy established than it is to buy or build new. And until we see those scales tip in favour of new builds, it's unlikely to really change the dynamics of supply. Um, and so what that ultimately means is established housing prices are going to have to continue to rise until we see those scales being tipped. Well, you talked about build to rent and that takes a while to get established in Australia, but that's not heading aiming at the affordable end of the market. And all these measures in the budget that came out recently were really, as you said, to 
they were framed in the light of supporting the government's goal to build 1.2 million homes over the next five years. So that's over five years' time. We know we're already starting with a deficit. But there's no real emphasis on social housing. There's a little bit more for social housing, not a lot for affordable housing. It's not going to make things more affordable. And yes, there's some rental subsidies increasing a bit, but I, I can't see rents coming down either. No, I can't either. And, and you know, you mentioned their rental assistance did increase. So it was increased in the budget by 10% off the back of we already had one increase late last year, which I believe was 15%. I think it just really showcases uh, the gross need to increase that rental assistance because our more vulnerable uh, households across Australia are really doing it tough. And when you have a look at the private rental market, We've seen house and unit rents roughly increase 40% in four years. You know, that is an astronomical increase in asking rents. And you, you mentioned also social housing here. We really do have an undersupply of social homes across Australia. So what that means is our more vulnerable Australians are being pushed into the private rental market. And that's being really challenged because rental assistance just hasn't Um, increased in line with what we've seen the overall rental market do. And, you know, this isn't just one pocket of Australia in terms of this rising uh, uh, rent prices. This is national. You know, we have been in a national rental crisis that has um, hit all corners of Australia. And, you know, build to rent, you know, um, touch on what you said about build to rent. Build to rent is that interesting one. And, you know, I'd love your opinion on this because Melbourne is almost the one that's leading the way in the build to rent sector. But build to rent is one of those. These tends to be higher calibre properties, so they have more inclusions in the in the actual property. But research does show there are papers out there that show, irrespective of where that supply is, whether it's the premium end, middle end, lower end, a one percent increase in supply can have a greater impact overall on prices as well as rent. So a one percent increase in supply can lead to a decrease in asking rents and prices by, you know, two, two and a half percent. So irrespective of how premium the property is, even if it's in the build to rent sector and it's that high end rental property market, it has what you call that domino effect. People who are on those higher incomes move into those higher spec homes higher priced rental accommodation, but then that frees up other accommodation and you get that movement of renters. Well, there's a couple of things that come out of that, Nicola. One is that people don't just rent because they're poor or because they can't afford to buy a home. So there's been lots of evidence of people with higher incomes renting, and a lot of it has to do with their stage and their lifestyle. They're not ready to settle down in a particular area. Maybe they've just got divorced. Maybe they've just got married. So there's definitely a requirement for more premium accommodation. But just for those who don't fully understand, the concept of build to rent is that a development occurs. It's usually apartments, but it can in fact be a group of houses where the developer holds them in the long term, does not sell them, keeps them as long-term accommodation, and the government is giving incentives to make that work. So it's actually rather than what we love to call mum and dad investors owning residential accommodation to rent, it's actually superannuation funds, international corporations, and our big developers. But of course, they've got other options. So it's got to be financially viable for them to do it. So one of the things I don't particularly like is that the government's giving them subsidies out of our tax money, using your and my money to subsidise the big developers. Um, I'd rather them give it to me and I'll buy another investment property. But having said that, I can see the need for people to have secure long-term accommodation if they've got from a landlord that isn't planning to sell. That helps them a bit. But currently, It doesn't make sense. It's not financially viable to build the cheaper ones. And so, therefore, Mervax just finished one in North Melbourne, uh, right right near Queen Victoria Market at the end of last year. And they proudly said how the rents were 20% higher than rents already in that area. Of course, there's other facilities there as well to make the accommodation worth a bit more people prepared to pay. So, on the one hand, it's not providing affordable accommodation. On the other, the numbers proposed are not really going to move the needle very far. So, of course, you're right. If there's more accommodation, more supply, it will make a difference. But at the present time, considering the time frames involved and considering also having spoken to uh, some valuers about this, there's 
difficulty the built or insect is having difficulty getting funding. Currently, local funders are not as familiar with this, so they're, they're a bit more concerned about funding it, even though I've just read recently of a very large international institution that's ploughing billions into built to rent here. It's definitely going to be a force in the future and it's going to provide supply. Let's see what it does to prices, though. Yeah, I, and I agree, Michael. I mean, it's so in its infancy in Australia and it's much more established in the US and, and the UK. I believe it's around 10% of the rental market in the US and I think just over 5% uh, in the UK. It's a very small part of our rental market here. And I do agree with you as well that it's part of the solution. It's not the solution. And, you know, it, it, there are many things I think that we need to see happen. And it's predominantly on the supply side. You know, we have got very high levels of population growth, predominantly driven by um, net overseas migration. And we need to be making sure that our population growth is also matched by the number of homes that we are uh, building each year. And, you know, the situation that we're in today, I, you know, I always think this isn't something that has been born out of the last couple of years. This has been years, decades in the making of an undersupply. I do think, you know, when you look at the various studies out there, they describe a term that's called underhoused. So it means people who are not living in accommodation that suits their needs. So it might mean the home is overpopulated with too many people. It might mean that they're living in a caravan or a tent or in their car, which are some of the extreme stories that we actually hear. Yeah. And, and I think that it's very hard actually to quantify the underhoused part of our Australian population. And I I think as a nation, you know, we shouldn't be having that scenario. Um, and I, I, I do think that this is where governments, and I'm really keen for your view on this, Michael, like when I look at government and I look at the budget, you know, it's an election year. Um, and I just think that I'm really happy that we are focusing on supply. But I actually think the next step Two steps probably is number one, I really wish governments would be more visionary and have that longer term approach for supply and really be building Australia for the future to ensure that we do continue to provide the homes that are needed for Australians. Well, governments have shorter election timeframes and so really in many ways, while they should be long-term and visionary, as you suggest, Nicola, uh, that they want to make sure that they satisfied the electorate this year to um, get into government again. Now, the government's recognised the crisis and they're now spending money on infrastructure. It sounds like a lot when you say $9.6 billion on housing and crisis accommodation. I'm not sure exactly how much that gets you when you spread it amongst all the various states. For example, they're talking about... $89 million to train more people, more tradies. It's going to plan to bring 20,000 new tradies in. Interestingly, that, I don't know how long it takes, but that's probably three or four years before they're going to come out of TAFE. It could be less than that. And that's only adding 1.7% to the existing construction workforce. Speaking to people on the ground, it's no longer a lack of materials that's holding back builders, but it's actually the lack of trades. So even if they could build more, they actually can't get the relevant trades. Yes, we're going to import some more with changes in the visa system. None of this is going to work over the next year or two or three. So yes, there's an election coming up, so there'll be a lot of rhetoric, a lot of talk about this. Not sure that we're going to notice anything on the ground. You've actually done a bit of work in the rental markets with your latest domain rental report too. Have you noticed any difference amongst the states or capitals versus regional? So, yeah, I mean, it's still very strained overall, Australia's rental market. I think what we're noticing is certainly regional markets are probably in a, uh, an improving situation is probably the better way to describe it. I think it's still strained, but I think the overall dynamics of Australia's rental market is rental growth is concentrated in our major capital cities rather than into those regional areas. So, um, and it is different. We've pretty much got record rents across all of our cities apart from houses in the ACT and units in Hobart. My observation is Canberra and Hobart do tend to find, or Tasmania I should say, their property markets seem to mirror what happens with migration population dynamics and both of those have got um, a net negative flow of people to other states and territories, which I do tend to observe. It does weigh in on their housing markets. But 
You know, house rents, we saw uh, the steepest quarterly gain in 17 years across our combined capitals. And unit rents, it's it's record-breaking. Obviously, we know unit rents are much more affordable. They, they are a big chunk of our rental market in our bigger capital cities. We've now seen 11 back-to-back quarters of uh, rising unit asking rents. Um, and I think, you know, I, I do think there's an affordability dynamic going on. It's steering demand towards units, uh, which are obviously much more affordable. And I do think we're still seeing a bit of a consolidation of housing. So people are getting a housemate or going into a house share because we've seen such dramatic change in the affordability landscape across our cities in particular. Interesting, despite the fact that property values keep rising, rents keep rising. I was fascinated to read a report on domain.com.au written by you that there are still 106 suburbs that are cheaper to buy now than five years ago. That was before COVID, Nicola. I know. It seems quite remarkable. And and I know that you and I have spoken about this so many times. It really showcases that there are thousands of property markets going on. Um, And it really does showcase the need to be armed with information. You know, I do think as a a potential buyer out there, it is about understanding the dynamics of the particular local area and which you're looking to purchase. And, you know, one of the markets that's really leading the suburbs that are cheaper now than five years ago, which just seems crazy, doesn't it? It is really dominated by Melbourne. Um, particularly in the unit sector. And Melbourne has been one of these markets that has fascinated me in recent times because we did see a bit of a price fall recently, but it's still higher than the price trough. Um, But pretty much over the last 18 months, we've seen property prices at a capital city level go sideways. I don't think I've ever really observed such stagnant conditions in Melbourne's property market as I'm currently observing today. But when you get down to the suburb level, that's when you really see that density where you've got some suburbs uh, rising, you've got other suburbs falling. And, you know, I'll pick out some of them where they are lower than what they were uh, five years ago. And I'll I'll concentrate on Victoria. So Malvern East down almost 14% compared to five years ago. West Footscray down 13%. CBD as well of Melbourne down almost 13% compared to five years ago. These are mainly apartments, aren't they, Nicola? Yeah, they're, they're all the ones I mentioned there are apartment uh, markets. And, uh, you know, you and I both know that you need to take care if you are looking to purchase in a market that has uh, falling property price. Because obviously, the worst case scenario is that they continue to fall and you find yourself in, in a negative equity. But we know that, that uh, property markets are all about the long game. And I think if you've got those foundational aspects for Uh, property prices to rise. And I am really of the firm belief that Melbourne eventually will get to the point where it will overperform compared to some of our other capital cities, because it's highly unusual. You tend to find Sydney and Melbourne property price cycles follow one another quite closely. And pretty much for almost five years now, Melbourne has underperformed compared to Sydney. So it will come a point in time where Melbourne will be viewed as undervalued compared to other cities. Well, it should already be viewed as undervalued. When is it going to pick up? We've discussed this before. I've uh, tried to work out in my head why Melbourne is so underperforming and particular apartments. And yes, there was an oversupply for a while. And yes, we were locked down more with COVID. And yes, the local government has uh, made things difficult by uh, using property investors as an ATM and taxing them more. The fundamentals underpin reverting to the median. If we look at long-term capital growth in all capital cities, and we've tracked this now back to 1980 based on Australian Bureau of Statistics and RAIA data, there's in every capital city been periods of five, seven years, even a decade at times. Look at Perth, where property values have been flat, hardly grown, and then they've reverted to the mean. Over the last 45 years or so that they've been keeping regular statistics, the Australian Bureau of Statistics data suggests that Melbourne has slightly outperformed the averages, and I think it will revert to the mean, which means that if you buy the right right sort of property, one that's going to be in continuous strong demand over the long term in Melbourne, Um, there's actually already built in intrinsic equity in a lot of these apartments. But I know some of the apartments you're talking about, uh, the student accommodation apartments in suburbs, well, I saw that from your report, like uh, Carlton in Melbourne, 
I guess the message is there's not one property market and you shouldn't talk about the Melbourne or the Sydney or the Brisbane market. And even with apartments, there are apartments, townhouses, uh, luxury apartments for right sizes, small apartments for students and studio apartments. So it's got to be careful. But uh, yes, just because it's cheap doesn't mean you should buy it, does it? Absolutely not. Um, And I think, you know, what's interesting about Melbourne's market is I do think there's a couple of things that are underpinning the more subdued nature that we've seen. And and I think it goes back to population dynamics. And, you know, Melbourne tends to, or the state of Victoria is, you know, normally roars in terms of population growth. You know, it has strong overseas migration and it has positive, strong levels of interstate migration. So that means that what we tend to see is more people move to Victoria than they're leaving from other states and territories. Now, that latter trend is not there at the moment. It's still negative, which means that there is a drain away. People are still leaving Victoria more so than arriving. And that is weighing in. And, and is a really unusual population dynamic for Melbourne. And, you know, what you were just describing, it's kind of, you know, you tend to find that dynamics revert back to that, that, that mean performance. What we're, try, what we're seeing in that population dynamics is it trying, it's trying to get back to what we would normally see. And it's improving, but just not into the positive. Eventually, that will revert back to what we normally see, and that is strong levels of interstate migration. And we've already got a, a strong overseas migration. But the other observation that I've, I've seen for Victoria overall is investors are really shying away from the Melbourne market. And that is because disincentives have built up over time for investors through various changes. And, you know, taxation changes, land tax is that example, have been, I think, a real negative sentiment driver. But interestingly, the cohort of buyer that has been rising is first home buyers. Um, And I think what first home buyers are utilising is this areas where prices are still falling or just the general overall stable environment that that Melbourne's pricing has currently had, coupled with the fact you've got still got a very tight rental market. So if you're in Melbourne, you're renting, I think people are just going, right, I'm going to fast track my decision to purchase and they're making their move now. I do think we know it's a long game and I do think that many of these buyers, first-time buyers, will really be reaping the benefits if they stay in their properties long term and they do play that longer game. And, you know, I, and I think probably the decisions for many to purchase now would have been the right ones for their, their circumstance, given the tight rental market. Well, last time I remember Melbourne's market as bad as this was in the early 90s. I started investing in the 70s and during the 80s, there was a property boom. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, between 1980 and 89, Melbourne's property market increased by 14.4% per annum. And then we had the recession we had to have in the early 90s and people left Victoria. Victoria suffered more than many other states. A bit similar to what you were just saying, Nicola, that there was an outpouring of people there. I, I remember the joke saying the last person leaving Victoria, please turn the lights off. And so until (laughs) about 1996, property values slumped, particularly commercial properties, and overall property values increased by 1.2% per annum. Again, uh, high-end expensive properties suffered most because businesses were doing very poorly. Then from 1997, the market picked up again. And interestingly, uh, for a 20-year period till 2006, grew according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 8.4% per annum. So it outperformed a lot of other areas. And then it dropped a bit in 2017 when there were the financial issues and then COVID brought it on. So Melbourne has had periods like this before and caught up. But I remember for many years after we opened our office in Brisbane that there there was quite a long period between 2011 and 2018 that overall the Brisbane property market only did 1.5%, 2% per annum. But Choosing the right property, adding value, doing the right things allows you to outperform the averages, Nicola. It certainly does. And you you mentioned Brisbane there. And, you know, Brisbane's housing market continues to, to, to steam ahead. And I think, you know, you mentioned units we know were oversupplied in Brisbane for a very long period of time, but they continue to strive for new record highs. And it, it showcases that it did have a long period of time of oversupply, underperformance in the pricing environment, but has really had its heyday since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, really. And even when you look at the, the pullback in price that we saw across most of our cities, 
it was actually quite minor, really, in Brisbane overall and didn't take long to fully recover. Well, one of the other reports that you came up with, and I see you do lots of interesting reports and people can get that on domain.com.au and I'll leave a link to it, was you did a bit of an assessment about prices per square metre. What were you looking at when you did that? So this was a really interesting one. It's an annual report that we do and we look at price per square metre of houses um, across our different um, cities and we look at that change uh, over time. It's particularly fascinating because it allows you to do that like-for-like comparison across the cities to see, well, what are the markets that are actually providing greater value? Because we've got some capital cities where blocks on average are much larger. Uh, Canberra is one of them. The average block size is um, just over 700 square metres, comparing it to Melbourne and Sydney, which is sitting at the 500 square metre mark. So it showcases that while Canberra technically has a higher overall median price than Melbourne, what you're getting in Canberra is actually much greater value for money, that bigger backyard, that bigger garden. So you're talking price per square metre of land or of dwellings? So combined both. It's it's based upon the sold price of of, uh, a house and land. So we use the the sold price and then the size of the, the block, as it were, the size of the parcel of land. And it allows us to look at things like, do that direct comparison. What is the value for money? And we've got a big conversation at the moment around increasing density, which I do think does scare some Australians when you're talking about higher density. But higher density comes in many forms. It doesn't mean high density as in, you know, 15, 20-storey apartment blocks. Higher density also means medium density. So things like terraced homes, townhouses that helps to create greater affordability. We know block sizes have been shrinking over time, and that is to drive uh, greater affordability. But we looked at what would be the, the flip of that. If block sizes hadn't shrunk compared to two decades ago, how much overall more would house prices be today? And I want to pick out some really great examples. So Perth was actually one of the cities that led this. So If we hadn't seen block sizes shrink in Perth over the last two decades, they would be, that median house price, 44% higher today than otherwise it would be. So what it showcases is that shrinking plot size has actually helped to contain that overall price being paid for a bar- from a buyer and helped to improve, and we know Perth is one of those more affordable markets, but helped to improve the overall affordability landscape in Perth. So the value is in the land, Nicola. Absolutely. We always said that, though, haven't we? Yeah, totally. Value is absolutely in the land. You know, land appreciates over time. And, you know, land is finite also. So what that means at that foundational level is we need to ensure that we're utilising our land efficiently and effectively as possible. And it's actually more cost effective to urban infill than it is to sprawl. You know, if the infrastructure is there, um, and I think New South Wales is that case in point where they announced recently to upsize um, land around train stations, so infrastructure hubs in their big uh, in in Sydney. And I think that that is a great move. I do think that we do need to see higher density. It needs to become in a variety of different forms. But overall, all of our capital cities have seen a shrinkage of land size. Some of them has been faster than others. But what that's done is actually benefited affordability. So so I'll I'll throw some other stats out there. So Adelaide house prices would be 16% higher than they would be otherwise today if block sizes hadn't shrunk. Melbourne, 14% higher. Some of the other cities, Sydney was a little bit smaller and it used to be 6% higher than otherwise would be. Um, but it just demonstrates, you know, and I love a stat that really helps to place something into context, that Perth's shrinking of land size means that house prices overall are $300,000 cheaper today. Wow. 
That's interesting, isn't it? So I guess if we, when we have this chat in a decade's time, there's going to be more <laughs> yeah. people living in apartments. There's going to be more people living in medium density. I see townhouses as being the way of the future. And yes, New South Wales has been talking about uh, rezoning. Melbourne did that a number of years ago where around uh, transport hubs and around train stations there can be more development. Uh, we've spoken before about the NIMBYs and the YIMBYs and uh, the challenges developers are going to have. But if we came to Australia today from overseas and you hadn't been here for a decade, uh, you probably wouldn't recognise the landscape. I think it's going to be much the same in 10 years' time again, Nicola, when there's going to eventually the market will move on, developers will be able to, will have to do new developments and many of them are going to be medium density and a small group of high density developments on our landscape. I, I do think we'll see a greater proportion of our ho- housing being in that medium density sector. I, I think that will be driven by affordability. And you've got to remember about 67% of Australia's population crowds in our eight biggest cities. So, And we le- live in some of the least dense cities in the world. So it does mean that we do need to embrace greater levels of density. Um, and I do think that the the hybrid of that is going to be the the, the medium density landscape. If we look at Sydney as that kind of test case, you know, at the moment, it's got a record price gap between houses and units. So a house is double the price of a unit. That creates issues on the housing ladder, because if you're a first home buyer and you've purchased a unit, your leap then to a house is so great. And that's where medium density really creates those stepping stones. It creates more of that ladder effect on the overall housing market. And it means that for a first-home buyer that they purchased a unit, the next step on the property ladder isn't as big. And so, yeah, I I agree with you. I do think the landscape is going to be different. I do think, though, that keeping the character and the charm and the heritage nature of, of suburbs is absolute priority, I think, from government as well. Uh, We're not going to lose that, but I think it's the right homes in the right places. Makes sense. Now, I think I'd just like to point out one of the comments you made just to clarify that, that a lot of first home buyers get into the apartment market seeing as a stepping stone. That's all they can afford. And they think I'm going to move up to a house. But As you've already suggested, houses have grown in value more than apartments, so it's better at least that they've got a foot on the property ladder, but it doesn't assure them to get into a home unless they move out far. And, of course, a lot of millennials are now moving to the family formation stage of their home, of their lives. Apartments aren't really the right answer. And when they decide what they want in the next accommodation. A lot of it has to do with bedrooms. Of course, it, they, they want to live in particular areas, but they can't compromise because they want at least another one or two bedrooms and or a home office or Zoom room. So that's creating a, a desire and need for more larger, medium density or, or, or homes in the outer suburbs. Yeah, and even in the middle suburbs, I think that's where our Oh, if they could afford it, that's where they want to be. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But that's where we need to address where can we add the supply in some of our medium, uh, sorry, middle middle suburbs to really uh, create that bridge. And look, working from home has been a great unlock because I think for some, it does mean that the compromise is less, you know, in terms of if you've got to live in an outer suburb and you're only in the office two or three days, it's actually a little bit more palatable in terms of that commute time. So I do think there's been other structural changes as overall uh, assisted kind of that affordability landscape also and where people can live. I think what we need to make sure is that our plans and where, you know, that red tape and also the partnering of different levels of government is really essential in ensuring the Australia of tomorrow is the right Australia for our swelling population. I think that's a great way to finish our chat. I always enjoy our (laughs) chats, but you're right. Australia is going to need to look at how to keep the beauty that we currently have but still manage to house our growing population. The government has a business plan of growing our population to around 40 million people by the middle of this century. That's a huge increase. It's almost like building another Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. So let's hope they get it right. Thanks for your time, Nicola. I'll be adding some links to Domain's reports in the show notes. Look forward to catching up with you again in a few months' time. Thanks so much, Michael.
I always enjoy my chats with Dr. Nicola Powell and the insights she brings. If you enjoyed our chat, but you don't currently subscribe, whether you're listening to the podcast or listening to it on YouTube, why don't you just stop for a second, subscribe so that twice a week you're going to get the insights from my guests. By the way, it'd be great if you left a review on whatever podcast app you're listening to this as well. Now, I guess the message behind our chat was that the markets are moving on. They've been rising since, I guess, January 2023 now, but our markets are fragmented. And there's no doubt that all the political, economic, financial challenges the world's throwing us as, at us is worrying many would-be home buyers and property investors. But how long are you prepared to wait? Because strategic investors aren't worried about where interest rates or the economy is going to be in three to six months. They're encouraged by where our housing markets are going to be in, I guess, five or ten years' time. So if you're interested in getting into property investment or buying a new home before the markets move substantially and FOMO drives the herd back into the market, why not have a chat with my team at Metropol? Go to metropol.com.au and organise an obligation-free chat with one of our wealth strategists. We're much more than just another buyer's agent. We help our clients safely create intergenerational wealth through property advice. And while we're big enough to tip the scales in your favour, we're small enough to care. So please go to metropole.com.au. There's a link in the show notes and organise an obligation-free chat with one of our wealth strategists. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. I've got to give credit for today's mindset message to Sahil Bloom. I subscribe to his newsletter and he said, your entire life will change the moment you change. Now, we've spoken about this concept before, but he actually suggested a number of things you can change that are going to help you improve your life. So let's go through his list. The first one is, your entire life is going to change the moment you stop gathering more information and start acting on the information you already have. He says there's somebody less qualified than you living the life you simply want, you want simply because they took action and you didn't. Dopamine from information gathering is a dangerous drug. So he says get your dopamine from action. So Hill Bloom also said your entire life is going to change the moment you stop expecting immediate results and start embracing delayed gratification. I've often spoken about this. Delayed gratification is the key to the life of your dreams. Everything you want in your life is on the other side of something that sucks. That suck might be 100 workouts. It might be 100 bland meals. It might be 100 hours of focused work. The best things in life require upfront pain. So embrace the suck, said Sir Hill Bloom. In the case of property investment, it really means having the discipline to spend less than you earn so you can save more, build up a nest egg, build up a deposit, and then get into property. He also said that your life is going to change when you stop complaining about things you can't control and start taking ownership over the things you can. Don't complain about anything, he said. If it's in within your control, do something about it. If it's not, complaining is a waste of energy. When you complain, you're giving too much power to the thing. Sahil Bloom suggests you take back that power. Sahil Bloom also suggests you should stop focusing on being impressive to others and start focusing on being impressive to yourself. Focus on the internal, not the external, he says. No amount of external affirmation will ever fill your cup if you don't feel the internal affirmation. So he suggests you should be impressive to yourself. Once again, your entire life will change the moment you stop fearing the regret of action and start fearing the regret of inaction. The regret of inaction is always more painful than the regret, regret from action. So take that leap, do that thing that scares the hell out of you, he suggests. You get one shot at this. At the end of your days, you're going to regret the things you didn't do much more than the things you did do. Again, as we go through a list of things that will change the moment you do something, he suggests stop saying yes to everyone else and start saying yes to yourself. You don't have to say yes to every single social gathering and event that you get invited to. Every single time you say yes to something, 
you don't really want to do, actually you're saying no to yourself. So his suggestion was embrace the power of no. So Hill Bloom also suggests you should stop worrying about what others are doing and start focusing on what you're doing. The time you spend comparing yourself to others is much better spent investing in yourself, he suggests. The only comparison worth making is to you from yesterday. Look how far you've come. So Hill Bloom also says your life's going to change when you stop waiting for things that you want in life and start acting to make them a reality. In other words, there's no perfect moment. There's just moments and you decide what you make of them. Go make some imperfect moments perfect through action. So Hill Bloom also says your life's going to change when you stop hoping for luck to strike and start moving to create your own luck. When choosing between two paths, choose the path that has a larger luck surface, is his suggestion. Your actions put you in a position where luck's more likely to strike. It's hard to get lucky watching TV at home, isn't it? It's easy to get lucky when you're out engaging, learning, improving. He also has another long list of things that you could change your life by doing, and I'm going to share them in next week's Mindset Message. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it. Or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?